Oh, but this one, this is a very interesting article. There's been a blow up lately. So obviously San Diego Comic-Con happened a, a few days ago. Um, and disregarding whatever happened on the WB DC side, uh, Marvel completely dominated the show. Uh, they dominated in a way that only Marvel can, and that is by announcing not just a, a shit ton of shows and movies, but announcing the, the tentative release dates for all of those things and having it all timelined out and, and, and organized by phase. And phase four is officially dead with, uh, I think Kevin Feige said that phase four is officially dead with, uh, with uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which by the way, the trailer for that looks looks amazing. Uh, I didn't really know what to think of it prior to, because there wasn't really a whole lot of information released about it. Uh, but I didn't know what to think of it prior to. But once I saw how Namor looks and what... Um, it's not Atlantis. I forget the name of what his, his city is called. It's something very Aztec-inspired. Once I see, see what the design of all that looks like, and I saw that really emotional trailer, and obviously there's... Um, you know, with Chadwick Bo Boseman's passing, there's a, a, a lot of emotion uh, that's played up about about that, and it's it, it is it is it is a moving trailer, but I mean, it just also looks really awesome. It looks like it's going to be a great movie. But um, yeah, Phase Four ends with that, and then they sketched out everything that was going to happen in Phase Five, and it's like, oh man, there's a lot of stuff going on in Phase Five. And then they even talked about Phase 6. And so far, the only thing... They've announced three movies in Phase 6, and the rest were all blanks. But, you know, they announced Fantastic Four, and then uh, Avengers The Kang Dynasty, and then Avengers uh, Secret Wars. So, I mean, they're just all all about it. They're, they are cranking, cranking this shit out. Yeah, they are cranking this shit out. But as a result of cranking this shit out, they are... Uh, it's not new. It's been in the. It's been. It's been. It's trended on Twitter several times the past few months. Uh, it's been in the news quite a bit the past few months about uh, Marvel and their not very worker friendly uh, domination of. Um, they're not uh, worker friendly domination of the VFX industry, and it sucks because like a lot of the points of contention with. Uh, VFX uh, in Marvel related circles over the past few months has been like oh the VFX for this looks like looks like shit like there were some people that thought that the VFX in, in uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness wasn't great obviously there was a bunch of kerfuffle about uh, the VFX in the She-Hulk trailer the first She-Hulk trailer that dropped and you know there's just been a lot of that going on but there's also been a lot of like okay um the reason why some of this stuff doesn't look great whenever you know the first trailer drops or whatnot is because you know these vfx houses are backed up and overworked and there's a lot of it's not just marvel like there's a lot of properties in development across marvel dc uh, uh, warner brothers in dc or just uh warner brother properties in general their movies hbo max stuff um whether it's peacemaker or you know any of those other shows uh and then you have uh, Paramount with all their Star Trek series. You have Strange New Worlds and, you know, they have Picard and all of that. And then you have Netflix with Stranger Things and, you know, all of these other shows that require an incredible amount of CGI. Amazon, you have The Boys and you have Wheel of Time and, oh my god, that Lord of the Rings Rings of Power looks phenomenal. It looks great. But you have all of these properties that are coming out now. I haven't even touched network television, what's coming out on network television that requires CGI or any of the movies that are getting dropped that require CGI that aren't uh, 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 Marvel movies or comic book movies. Plus, we're t and I, I didn't even touch on Star Wars, all the Star Wars stuff, including those shows that are like 100% CGI, like, uh, like um, The Bad Batch. You know, like, and, 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 and there's just a lot. There's a heavy, heavy, heavy demand for VFX. And Hollywood, these production companies, they are not bending their timelines to accommodate for the backup. So, you know, ideally, 
and I say this from the point of view of labor, not necessarily from the point of view of fans who want this stuff to come out as quickly as possible. Certainly not from the point of view of, you know, the capital interests that want to make their money back on these investments as soon as possible. But at least from the point of view of labor, ideally, as this demand for their work, you know, piles up, you know, the timelines in which they're given and to, to work at a reasonable pace uh, on a reasonable amount of work would, would stretch out. So you would see these release dates uh, become farther, farther, farther and further apart. And, you know, you would see more staggering of that work based on those elongated release periods or development periods so that they don't get crushed by the weight of all this work. That's never going to happen. Like if something's got to give, it's it's if something's got to give and the people with the money are the ones making the choice, then let's reference the old triangle here. Good, fast or cheap. Pick two, you know. And capital interests will always pick these two. Low cost, done quickly. And if you have something akin to a monopoly on a market, then the low quality aspect isn't gonna matter. If you don't have a monopoly on the market, um, and, and, and when I say that in, ref in, in respects to uh, how Marvel and Disney operates in the market of these VFX houses, like they control a lot in the industry with their money and with how things get, get uh, scheduled for release like movies that aren't Disney movies have to cater to the Disney schedule so they have a lot of power even outside of you know the things they have direct control over so when you have that kind of power that kind of money and that kind of influence you don't necessarily need to worry about the quality all that much especially if you're getting the kind of returns on these movies that Marvel's getting you know, even their 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 flops, as it were, like what Eternals maybe was is Eternals their lowest performing one of recent years. Four hundred two million, two hundred. Uh, I mean, it, it it doubled, so it did just enough to break even, I guess. So there is that. <laughs> I mean, even their lowest, their their worst performing movie broke even still. Or maybe did a little bit better than break, break even, depending on how much they spent on marketing. So when you have that kind of uh, that kind of of power, then yeah, you will be willing to sacrifice some quality in order in order to get it done quickly and get it done at a low cost. So what that means is, if you're a VFX house that works for Marvel, <laughs> you you aren't gonna be like. Ideally, like depending on how you like to work, done quickly and high quality is what you want because that's where you make the most money. <laughs> you know, it, there's no low cost in that one. If you want it done quick and you want it looking good, you better pay for it. You're gonna pay for it. Um, and some would argue that that's that that this could be what what uh, Marvel is all about, but. You know, with a two hundred million dollar budget movie, but I mean, most of these movies are two hundred million dollar budget. Mo they don't really go above two hundred million. That's kind of the cap, and that's been kind of the cap for a while now. Like, you know, they figured out a way to keep from inflating these movies. Like, hundred and eighty million dollars. It made eight hundred. Holy shit! Eight hundred fifty four million dollars on a one hundred eighty million dollar budget. Let's go back a little bit further. 250, so that was a little bit more. That was a little bit more than the 200 million dollar budget. Made 1.15 billion though, holy smokes. So yeah, the budgets haven't really changed over these past few years. When did this come out? This was uh, 2016. So the budgets haven't really changed all that much. Uh, it's, it's always hovered around 200 million, 200 to 250 million. But despite that, like they're being asked more and more, like when Captain America Civil War came out, like this and maybe one or two other Marvel movies, Marvel properties were in development at the time. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. You've got like, you know, three, four, five, six of these things being developed concurrently, you know, 
you had Miss Marvel that was under development the same time as Moon Knight, that's under development the same time as She-Hulk, that's under development the same time as as uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, who's under development the same time as as you know Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. You know, all of these things are like in development, are all in flight at once in various stages. And 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 when you talk about VFX houses, most people think post, and you know, yeah, a lot of that work is done in post, but you know, pre previs actually is a pretty massive component to how Marvel makes their movies too. It's a part of how they've streamlined their production process to be able to really crank out these movies uh, at a reliable clip. Like you don't really, it happens occasionally, but you don't really hear too much about like Marvel slipping on their release date, unless it's like, you know, COVID and shit like that. Generally speaking, though, when they announce a release date, they hit those release dates, or at least the release window, right? Like, it's never anything like, like, oh, we've got to do a, a crazy series of reshoots, and some, you know, tooling the VFX, and it's gonna take, it's gonna knock us off our schedule by like seven, eight months, or something like that. You don't ever really get that with Marvel, Marvel Pictures. They're they're a well-oiled machine. They announce the release, a release window, if not a release date. And then they hit it with each and every one of their properties on time under budget so when you have a, a a colossal machine that works so well like that you know and a lot of it a lot of the success is predicated on vfx both via previs and post you have that going on like you yeah you're gonna get as this guy quotes you're gonna get pixel fucked it's pretty well known, even darkly joked about across the visual effects houses that working on Marvel shows is really hard. When I worked on one movie, it was uh, when I worked on one movie, it was almost six months of overtime every day. Sounds familiar. I was working seven days a week, averaging 64 hours a week on a good week. Marvel genuinely works you really hard. I've had coworkers sit next to me, break down and start crying. I've had people have anxiety attacks on the phone. The studio has a lot of power over the uh, effects houses, just because it has so many blockbuster movies coming out one year after the other. If you upset Marvel in any way, there's a very high chance you're not going to get those projects in the future. So the effects houses are trying to bend over backwards to keep Marvel happy. To get work the houses bid on a project, they're all trying to come in, uh, come in right under one another's bids. With Marvel, the bits will typically come in quite a bit under, and Marvel is happy with that relationship because it saves money. But what ends up happening is that all Marvel projects tend to be understaffed, where I would usually have a team of 10 VFX artists on a non-Marvel movie. On one Marvel movie, I got two including myself. So at two? What? Wait, what? So every person is doing more work than they need to. How does that work? Like we all see those. I mean, everybody is familiar with the credits of a Marvel movie because of those damn post credit scenes. Like we see like the fucking five minute scroll of names that are, you know, part of VFX. How is it you only end up getting an effects house that allots two people to the project? The other thing, I wonder if it's like, I wonder if it's like they use an effects house to do all the rigging. And so they get two people in one effects house to do the rigging and they get another effects house where the people who do all of the lighting. So you get like maybe four people there that do lighting and then you get another effects house that I mean, it's probably maybe, I don't know. I could, I could see it working that way too. The other thing with Marvel is it's famous for asking for lots of changes throughout the process. So you're already overworked, but then Marvel's asking for regular changes way, uh, way in excess of, uh, what any other client does and some of those changes are really major maybe a month or two before a movie comes out marvel will have us change the entire third act it has really tight uh it has really tight turnaround times so yeah it's uh just not a great situation all around how do you change the entire third act one visual effects house could not finish a number of shots and reshoots marvel was asking for in time so marvel had to give my studio the work Ever since, that house has effectively been blacklisted from getting Marvel work. Part of the problem comes from the MCU itself, the sheer, just the sheer number of movies it has. Yeah, that's what I was just referencing. 
It sets dates, and it's very inflexible on those dates. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They set those windows, those either those 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 vague windows or those specific dates, and then like they don't really shift from them. They're pretty good about hitting those timelines. And a lot of that is because of all this. Yet it's quite willing to do reshoots and big changes very close to the dates without shifting them up or down. This is not a new dynamic. I remember going uh, to a presentation by one of the other VFX houses about an early MCU movie and people were talking about how they were getting pixel fucked. That's a term we use in the industry when a client will nitpick over every little pixel. Even if you uh, never notice it, a client might say, this is not exactly what I want and you keep working at it, but they have no idea what they want. So I mean, uh, yeah, 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 that's just working. That's just called working with a client. So they'll be like, can you just try this? Can you just try that? Uh, they'll want you to change an entire uh, setting, an entire environment, pretty late in the movie. Yeah, well, I mean, you could, I mean, that's the problem with, like, the incredible advances in, like, green screen and technology. Uh, digital, those digital green screens, you know, that means that you, you can ask a lowly VFX grunt to change an entire environment four weeks before the movie's in theaters. The main problem is most Marvel directors uh, aren't familiar with working with visual effects. A lot of them have just done little indies at Sundance Film Festivals and have never worked with VFX. They don't know how to visualize something that's not there yet, that's not on, uh, on set with them. So Marvel often starts asking for what we call final renders. As we're working through a movie, we'll send work in progress images that are not pretty but show where we're at. Marvel often asks for them to be delivered at a much higher quality very early on, and that takes a lot of time. Marvel does that because its directors don't know how to look at rough images early on and make judgment calls. But that is the way the industry has to work. You can't show something pre uh, super pretty when the basics are still being fleshed out. The other issue is when we're in post-production, we don't have a director of photography involved. So we're coming up with uh, we're coming up with the shots a lot of the times. It causes a lot of incongruity. A good example of when uh, what happens in these scenarios is the battle scene at the end of Black Panther. The physics are completely off. I think everybody would agree that that fight between Black Panther and Killmonger at the very end was was not good. Suddenly, the characters are jumping around doing all these crazy moves like action figures in space, or as I say, it's like anime. It's like watching a a, a weird anime. Suddenly, the camera is doing all these motions that haven't happened in the rest of the movie. It looks a bit cartoony. It has broken visual lang It has broken the visual language of the film. Things that uh, things need to change on two ends of the spectrum. Marvel actually uh, talked with somebody on Twitter about this. I didn't realize it was from this Vulture article. Uh, someone posted about this and said that um, they said something to the effect that um, oh geez, what did that dude say? Oh yeah, he said uh. He said, um, Marvel basically has zero structure to their creative process. They hire inexperienced directors and they can't coordinate their ideas for their shots. This explains why their movies feel disjointed, yet they are the benchmark for creativity. And I just responded with, it's not zero structure. It's a very specific structure designed to streamline the post-production process by keeping the visual creatives out of it. And by utilizing VFX artists as, a, as machine robots cranking out sausage by metrics, it's effective at releasing on time and under budget. So, like, this whole idea that directors or photography is not involved, well, like, there are two things here. One, yeah, they do get a lot of indie or inexperienced um, uh, directors to start directing these movies. And a lot of the reason why they can get away with that is because of this this article here will explain what their pre-production looks like and a lot of their pre-production plots out what the movies look like before the director even gets involved like the director on a marvel movie isn't the same as a director on a normal movie they're kind of like a basically like a almost like a glorified babysitter that kind of shepherds a predetermined uh that kind of shepherds a predetermined um animatic along you know while shooting you know they, they shooting uh, the, the actors their principal actors uh to a preset animatic that they were delivered you know when they decided to to take the project you know and and it's good for those small developers if they don't like if you, if they just want experience working on something big and they don't want to have like you know what happened with josh trank ha uh, happened with with them then this is actually like a pretty good setup for for those guys 
because the weight of the success of these movies, and by success, I'm not talking about monetary success. By success, I'm talking about success from the point of view that a producer would would gauge it, which is that you finish, you finish with uh, a production. Uh, a, a I guess I uh, using the word production multiple times uh, eliminates it from my vocabulary, but having a theater ready theater uh, quality product delivered on time and under budget. Like that's all they really care about. Like get us something that looks like it stands with the rest of like these blockbuster movies that we're putting out in theaters and get it to us on time and under budget. And like the method that Marvel uses to develop these movies, uh, you could take a guy that doesn't have a great deal of experience with like big blockbuster movies. So long as they know how to run a set, generally speaking, uh, their system uh, could be run by those dudes with relative ease. Relative ease. I mean, it's still, I'm not trying to undersell it or anything. It's still a gargantuan process, but there's a lot that's taken off of those developers' plates. And a part of that is this post-production process. So you have these indie developers who maybe don't have like the kind of clout that you know a well-known and well-established director like maybe a Sam Raimi would have. Um, Sam Raimi's been making awesome movies for for decades at this point. People love him, and he has his own fan base. He has his own thing going. And there's a real risk with someone like that. If people weren't really already familiar with how Sam Raimi works, and, you know, he, people love Sam Raimi. People love working for him. Like, if they didn't have that sense, like, the, there's a real risk of bringing somebody like that to a project and then just having them, you know, be the 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 our tour with all of the clout and the shadow of their presence, you know, for better or worse, like there's a plus to that. There's a minus to that too. And studios famously don't like directors like that who don't take studio notes. You know, that's what gets Warner brothers into, into trouble with a lot of, you know, their work. Whenever you hear Warner brother uh, or DC fans talk about, you know, oh, the studio, the producers are messing up these movies. You know, they're, they're trying to finagle it and they just need to let the directors do their art, do their craft. And it's like, well, I, I, I agree to a certain extent, but if you're trying to, if you're making this argument while also at the same time wanting uh, DC to function more like Marvel, like I think those things kind of uh, are, are at loggerheads with one another. Like Marvel's process incorporates production or, or stu uh, studio notes directly into like the the bones and structure uh, of how a director is chosen, how they're brought into the project, how they're shepherded through it, and at which point they get cut off from the project, essentially, ostensibly, which is post production, you know. And without these guys, and and because these are indie or smaller developer or sm developer smaller directors who want to get their name out there they want to prove that they can you know uh, they can man a big property a big IP they want they want the pop that comes from oh this is the director of you know Captain America etc etc et and then you know they move on from there and you know being a part of this process while having you know, both hands held basically at that time you could see how uh, how a set is run and you know how to how to operate like under a giant IP and all this other sort of stuff, and they can develop these indie uh, indie uh, di uh, directors into being you know bigger you know Sam Raimi type directors. But so long as they're at this level, they're going to be very amiable to studio notes in a way that like your bigger name Artur probably wouldn't be. So the studio can control these directors from that end. Like oh, you're just a small director. We're going to give you a shot. But, you know, this is our process. We have a lot of control here, here, here. We're going to expect this here, here, here. At this point, we're going to roll you off the project. We're going to send it to the VFX house, and, the, and they're going to do their business there. You know, any director that wants to, like, ingratiate themselves in, like, the colossal machine of, of blockbuster Hollywood where all the money is, they're going to go right along with that. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. Like, this is just a, this is just capes. It's just a comic book movie. This isn't like my, my, you know, my uh, magnum opus. You know, I might have a, a Twin Peaks thing that I want to work on on my own when I get enough clout. 
when I have enough big movies and a lot of successful movies under my belt and I could be able to take that independent of, of Disney or Marvel or whatever to Lionsgate or something or Blumhouse or anybody else and be like, okay, this is the title that I want to make. You know I'm good for it because of, you know, all of these Marvel movies and shit that I've been making. You know, these are $200 million properties that, you know, grossed $500, $800 billion or $1 billion at the box office. You know I'm good for it. I've got the experience. Now it's time for me to make my Artur thing. Uh, I mean, I think that's why a lot of these indies uh, get involved in, in Marvel. And Marvel, for their to credit them you know at the at the expense of uh these poor effects houses and probably some other you know peep grunts in the in the machine that we haven't heard from yet they do a pretty good job of shepherding these these directors through um so you know that's that's a part of this machine process that marvel has and you know you get a small di a, a director and you can kind of handle them the way you want to handle them on the front end and then on the back end, you have this situation where you kind of kick them out of the post process and you have, you know, the, the VFX house, you know, basically finishing out your movie. And it, it can't say anything other than it's been a successful formula for Marvel. Not so successful, I guess. Well, maybe it, depend, it depends on your, how you measure success. Maybe it's successful for these VFX houses, but it sounds like not so much. It sounds like a, it's not worth the money or the stress. So, you know, some of the problems I mentioned are universal to every show and every project, but you end up doing less over time on other shows. You end up being able to push back more on the directors. Exactly. 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 That's why they don't want the directors. I mean, there's only, like, they hire these indie directors and these smaller directors who haven't done a whole lot because they want to be the ones that push on the directors, you know. They don't want the directors pushing on them. They want to push on the directors from the front end. And then by the time that they take that to the VFX house, director's not involved. No VFX artist is going to be able to push back on the directors because they're not there. They're going to have to push back on Marvel and, and D uh, Disney. And nobody pushes Marvel or Disney at this point. So that's exactly why it's structured this way. That's exactly why it's a machine that's just cranking out this sausage nonstop. And, you know... There, uh, that's that. When they say something like, hey, I want this, you could be like, this doesn't make sense. Not every client has the bullying power of Marvel. So that's what happens in post-production for a Marvel movie. But what about pre-production? This article came out uh, about a year ago. It's actually pretty neat. I haven't watched this video, but let's see what's going on with this video. This shot is a rough version of the final battle in Avengers Endgame, and it looks pretty similar to what you saw in this shot. This shot is a rough version of the final battle in Avengers Endgame, and it looks pretty similar to what you saw in theaters. But the process of putting this rough shot together began three years before the movie came out, well before the actors went on set and before a single frame was captured on camera. These rough shots are called previs, short for pre-visualization. Essentially, this tool allows filmmakers to digitally map out how they want any given scene to look. Directors can then use the previs as a guide for how to film scenes, sometimes frame for frame, once everyone's on set. Previs has been around for a long time, but in earlier movies, it was used in a much more limited way. They were used for just small pockets of that movie for the one big visual effects shot, for the big finale sequence. But now, instead of just using previs in small doses, companies like The Third Floor Terrible have developed movie. it into a tool Terrible for designing movie. entire movies. And no studios embrace that approach more than Marvel, which has enlisted the help of The Third Floor for 19 of the 23 films in its Infinity Saga. For 2014's Captain America The Winter Soldier, Marvel had gotten to the point of pre-visualizing two-thirds of a movie. Today, the studio is known to use visualization to map out every single scene. Not just action scenes, either. For Endgame, the third floor is... Like, really think about epic. that. Think about that. Like, when you're watching these, these pre-vis animatics, for think about... Entire movies. This is... This is... These are... This is... This is visual effects. Granted, it's not like, you know, it's not, you know, polished you know, in-product uh, VFX that you would expect 
when you go pay money and sit in front of a, a screen at a theater. But it's still, this is still something that, you know, people had to take time out of their day to create. Like, storyboards were sent to these this, these houses, these effects houses. Again, in this case of uh, Endgame that they were talking about, years before the, the movie ever came out, and uh, probably years before the movie even went into pr uh, uh, production, uh, these, stu these, these effects houses, you know, are being used on the front end to a pretty colossal degree. They make these movies in rough animatics before the movies are ever shot, you know, and then... On the back end of that, they have to do the VFX on the post side too, you know. So, like every Marvel movie and every uh, maybe uh, maybe the TV shows are, are are different. Not sure. Wouldn't be surprised if they weren't. But I don't know about the TV shows. When you think about the fact that like nearly every Marvel movie has been made twice: once in VFX from top to bottom, and then like shot, and then had VFX put in in post. That's a hell of a grind for these for these VFX houses. That is a colossal grind. Brace that approach more than Marvel, which has enlisted the help of the third floor for 19 of the 23 films in its Infinity Saga. For 2014's Captain America The Winter Soldier, Marvel had gotten to the point of pre-visualizing two-thirds of a movie. Today, the studio is known to use visualization to map out every single scene. Not just action scenes, either. For Endgame, the third floor's work touched everything from the comedic scene with Hulk in the diner to emotional moments, like the one between Hawkeye and Black Widow on Vormir, leaving nothing up to chance in one of the most expensive movies ever made. Okay, that movie, that movie, <laughs> as I was talking about, uh, and one of the most expensive movies ever made. As I was talking about budgets, you know, most, most Marvel movies generally hover around the 200, 250 million dollar budget range. I think it's, I think it's acceptable to expect in games budget to be far in excess of that. Uh, it's definitely a, the exception and not the norm on that one. But outside of Endgame and maybe probably Infinity War as well, um, most Marvel movies generally tend to be around two, 200 to 250 million. What was, uh, let's take one look at, uh, at uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Because that's a VFX heavy one that, uh, 200 million. Uh, let's try Spider Man. No way home because that one is a cameo Latin movie. Well, I guess uh, Doctor Strange was as well. Two hundred million, yeah. Most of them are two hundred million, two hundred fifty million. Only really, uh, only really, um, Endgame kind of exploded that. The first visualizations of a Marvel film will often begin before the script's fully finished. And that actually is the best place for a professional visualization team, is to be able to make bridges and try out some experiments between departments that have a crazy idea that may or may not work. You know, you want to be able to throw things at walls and see if they stick. Occasionally, rough previs might be underway even before the cinematographer or director has signed on to the project, a practice that can be controversial in Hollywood. Director Lucrecia Martel said she turned down the offer to direct the upcoming Black Widow movie after Marvel told her not to worry about the action sequences. It is true that Marvel encourages their team of previs artists to play an active role in story development. Jeff Ford, the editor for Endgame, said that the third floor's visualization supervisor, Gerardo Ramirez, who'd worked on nine prior Marvel films, was like an additional director, writer, and editor on the project. That's because previs artists are involved in just about everything from the start, helping to map out story beats and shots, and consulting on everything from blocking, staging, lighting, how heroes will use their power in big fights, and even the timing and tone of any given scene. To understand just how crucial Previs is to Marvel's process, let's go back to that final battle from Endgame, specifically the Avengers Assemble moment, when all the heroes return one by one through portals. The third floor presented Marvel with two Previs takes on that arrival moment. One was slower and more emotional, while the other was higher energy and had the heroes arriving mid-charge. Ultimately, Marvel went with a blend of the two versions. A lot of this is done to save money. Today's previs tools allow filmmakers to do virtual location scouting and test out advanced camera work. 
Take, for example, the Sony Marvel movie The Amazing Spider-Man, which was shot in 3D. The filmmakers wanted to have some cool first-person shots of Spider-Man swinging through New York, but they didn't want to make audiences nauseous. So they used previs from the visualization studio Proof to determine how much and what type of movement people would be able to handle. All of this is then extracted into a blueprint for production called TechViz, which provides filmmakers with all the data and diagrams they'll need to actually recreate each shot in real life. Essentially, this is where all the detailed math happens. Remember this scene? Okay, interesting. So, like, with all the, data the mathematics is transported to, to, like, the actual cameras that then mimic those shots. Math happens. Remember this scene from Thor Ragnarok where Heimdall leads the Asgardians across the bridge? The third floor did the tech viz for that crane shot to work out the camera height and lenses they'd need along with the distance from which they'd film the characters. For Endgame, they produced over 100 different technical mock-ups containing information like this, all of it accurate to the real locations and equipment they'd be using. Getting all the numbers down pat is especially important for a movie like Ant-Man, where characters dramatically fluctuate in size from one moment to the next. Or Doctor Strange, where the folding city imagery required a lot of dimensional mathematics. And TechViz is useful for quieter beats, too. Marvel used it to define the camera parameters for this weighty scene between Hawkeye and Black Widow in Endgame to make sure they'd hit the right tone and visual impact. Filmmakers can even plug the data from TechViz into a motion control camera system, which lets you program precise, repeatable camera movements. They're also well-versed in programming robotic dollies, robotic cranes that move the camera around. Setting up such a tightly controlled shooting environment can speed up production a lot. And when you're on location for a Marvel movie, every minute counts. The visualization process doesn't end with shooting, though. The third floor's work on a Marvel film can run all the way up to the end of post-production because of the process called post-viz. This involves taking the live-action photography they've shot and combining it with the pre-viz elements. Take this moment in Endgame, where Strange, Spider-Man, and Star-Lord join the final battle. The third floor started with completely digital previs and tech viz for the shot, which Marvel then used to film the actors on a green screen. Next, the third floor reintroduced some key previs elements, like the background and the outline of the portal. For Endgame, the third floor's artists made 7,300 previs shots. Over 10,000 of those ultimately became post viz shots. The post viz shots serve as placeholders in early cuts of the film, allowing Marvel to quickly preview it before commissioning the finishing effects. Marvel will often screen these versions of the film, filled with post viz in front of test audiences to get an idea of how the film might be received. Plus, the post viz shots provide a template to the VFX artists, who take on the movie's final effects work. Using visualization from beginning to end can save Marvel millions on expensive effects and shoots. And ultimately, having all the technical stuff squared away will ideally free up the director to focus on getting the best performances from their actors on set. They can be warned about things that are up and coming that might impact their craft so that they're not surprised about it when they walk onto the set. But doesn't having all of these shots pre-rendered diminish the role of directors on Marvel movies? Not necessarily. Another advantage of in-depth visualization is that Marvel isn't limited to hiring big action directors. The studios become known for their unconventional director choices, often pulling talent from the indie or TV circuit. And that's where they can really benefit also from the previous process, as they can trust a team like ours to work with the stunt coordinator. So that all they have to do is be like an avid viewer of their own film as it's coming together and to be ma making comments like they do with everything else. Some directors might chafe at Marvel's wide ranging use of previs. Others may welcome the fact that Marvel has a dedicated team of previs artists and VFX specialists who know how to plan out action sequences. Marvel's extensive use of visualization has helped the franchise maintain a so then I wonder then all the way through Endgame. Given Marvel's box, so they have a lot of previs. I wonder then if those guys. It sounds like those guys might be in house. Those guys might be in house Marvel previs rather than you know what they're using from third party uh, VFX houses. Box office dominance. Other studios may follow their model of embracing visualization, even for smaller productions. 
The third floor has worked on a number of non-action films in recent years. Well, they're talking about the third floor. So the third floor is not... I mean, this isn't Marvel. So this is obviously a third-party VFX house of some sort. From art flicks like 2016's Nocturnal Animals to political biopics like 2018's Vice. Now that the digital world is merging in with the physical world, that is going to be the future of a lot larger swath of content creation than just these very ambitious productions. So there you go. There's the there, there's the Marvel sausage secret. Um, they previs the shit out of everything. Uh, they keep their directors on a tight leash. And then they kick them off of the project ostensibly whenever it goes to post. As a result, they lean very, very heavily on um, what, what these uh, VFX houses do in post in order to get their final product. So there you go. Done quickly. Done cheaply. They maintain a general sense of quality because they take a lot of the control away from the directors. And they strong arm a process through you know at 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 the expense of the people that are doing the work cheaply and quickly the marvel method hey everybody thanks for watching the video if you liked what you just saw hit the like if you want to see more hit subscribe i'd appreciate it if you did both they would be very good for the channel and help me build the community here if you have any kind of comments or opinions or anything like that by all means drop them in the comment section below i like engaging with y'all want to do more of that so thank you again and see you next time